would like to invite them one by one on stage uh, for our panel discussion. Our first guest is Marios Naufido. He's the founder of Hair ETC. Thank you. Please. Our second guest, guest is Christina Apostolou. She's the founder of Raising Gastronomies. Uh, delight. Mindful Delights. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> Mindful Delights, please. Have a seat. And our last guest of today is Mr. Lefteris Mohianakis. He's the founder of The Anima Concept. Thanks for coming, please. Have a seat. So, the interesting thing is that when I was contacting my guests, um, first starting with Mario and then Christina and then Lefteris, is that I added them to a WhatsApp group, and then I was about to introduce them, but they already knew each other. <laughs> <laughs> and not only knew each other, they were friends from years and years back, yeah. so I was the one left out with them yeah. instead of introducing them. So guys, welcome. Um, welcome to Startup Grind. I hope today we're gonna have a nice conversations, nice experience, and uh, before we get started, please go very quickly introduce you, your business, and what you do. Well, hello, thank you, thank you for coming tonight. Uh, Hesan, thank you for having us here. Uh, my name is Marius Neofidou. I am the creative director of Hair ETC Studio here in Cyprus. My background derives from uh, the hairdressing industry. I've been a hairdresser for many years, but my focus was always uh, working with session styling, so working backstage for um, creating hair for films, theater, fashion weeks, advertisements, etc. Um, and through that uh, experience through the many years, I, I started also working as an educator, traveling around the world, um, teaching for the brand Kevin Murphy, I was their education manager here in Cyprus. Uh, in parallel to the, um, to the education uh, aspect, a Hair ETC was created. It started originally as a, as a magazine, as a fashion and beauty magazine which later on started developing and became the studio that we have and a whole philosophy that is around it that we'll get to it later on. Thank you, Mario. Thank you. Christina? Hi, hi, and uh, thank you for coming. Um, so, yeah, my name is Christina Apostolou. Um, I'm in an industry at the moment that I never thought I would be in, uh, to be honest with you. It all happened very naturally, let's say, but my background studies uh, are in jewelry design. Um, in, uh, it's an industry in which I worked for a few years before uh, pairing up with my husband in the wine industry. Um, styling, packaging design, branding, marketing. And then, let's just say miraculously, I ended up in the industry that I'm in. I, um, I'm, I'm founder of Raising Gastronomes Mindful Delights. Um, we make energy bars, bliss balls and healthy, nutritious treats. Thank you, Christina. The first, by the way, everybody, can you hear us well? All good? Okay. The first. Hi. Hello. Thank you for inviting me. I'm uh, Lefteris Mohanakis. I'm originally from Crete, Greece. Uh, I study enology and I've been working as a winemaker and uh, consultant in several wineries around Greece, New Zealand and Cyprus. I'm uh, in Cyprus since 2007, uh, mainly working as a technology expert in uh, bigger wineries uh, and uh, production manager. Uh, one day I decided that uh, I don't want to make wines by pressing buttons anymore, so uh, I stopped working for uh, other wineries and I started establishing my own uh, my own brand of uh, wines and spirits. I'm working dedicated into onto uh, traditional Cypriot wines and drinks, made uh, exclusively out of uh, Cypriot grape varieties. Um, I think that uh, what I like the most is to think outside the box and uh, not following any guidelines and understanding gastronomy and tradition as uh, a chain in the history which it's in every one of us and including me we are a link 
and I'm trying to adapt uh, my knowledge uh, into the international state of uh, international understanding of uh, gastronomy and quality. So uh, I've designed my own line of uh, traditional secret products with a twist, a modern, uh, as I like to say, a postmodern twist. Uh, I do work as a, I do teach uh, winemaking in uh, Yukland and occasionally I write in several uh, magazines in Greece and Cyprus. Uh, my hobby is uh, astrophysics and <laughs> history. <laughs> 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 Yeah, we've got a we've got a really interesting combination of uh, individuals here. And by the way, before we get started with the discussion, we've got up there Slido.com. You can also scan the QR code, and I encourage you to do so. Or go to Slido.com and put the code SGCY. Basically, when you get in there with your phones, you can we put like a poll, a question for you to answer, so we get to know you. We ask you what kind of business are you running or are you just starting or that so please go there and also at any moment of the event you can post your questions um, through Slido and I receive it on my tablet so I can integrate your questions uh, with our discussion and at the end we're going to have live Q&A so um, more questions will be answered then. All right so I've got um, the, the, path, the, the way we're going to discuss here is that uh, there's no order. You can jump in any time that um, you think you have the better answer. That's not a competition. No <laughs> no. <laughs> so uh, I ask this question all the time from all, all of my guests through Startup Grind is, what was your first entrepreneurial experience? It can be very, very small and you can be very, very young as well. What was the first time that you did something and it was you know, either made money or made a little bit of success or publicity. Do you have any of sort of these stories? When I was in uh, <laughs> elementary school, uh, I started uh, destroying jeans uh, that I was uh, buying, used jeans, and destroying them. I was uh, listening to punk music at the, at the time, and I had too many clients trying to improve their uh, outfit by adding some uh, torn jeans. Mm. And did you try to sell them or? Definitely. Definitely. <laughs> did you make it, it did people buy it as well? Good. Well, it was nice. really successful. <laughs> <laughs> Very nice. Any yeah, other stories? Yeah. I'm thinking. Um, I, 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 well, I, I won't go to the, to the success part and the selling part, but I always saw myself with a business card. And I, I think I have a collection of, like, God knows how many business cards I've printed for myself over the years. From as, different professions. From different professions. Um, my, my first entrepreneurial um, experience, it was in the jewelry industry with, with my own uh, lines of jewelry, um, my own collections. And um, it wasn't a very... <laughs> Uh, it's not a very happy story, let's say, because I, I, I finished uni in the UK. I worked for a few years for, um, for a company as head designer, and then, then I decided that I wanted to leave London. London just wasn't the lifestyle that I was um, going for at the time. So I came to Cyprus and I just had... Um, it was, it, I wouldn't say it was a complete disaster, but it wasn't what I was expecting. I came to Cyprus with contemporary jewellery ideas, and being in Larnaca as well, which is, you know, slightly slower and smoother. Yes, it and it was a very, um, it was a huge cult culture shock, let's just put it that way. Um, I, I had a few exhibitions, uh, like solo exhibitions, where mainly my friends and relatives came. <laughs> um, but yeah, I, it, 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 I kept going, let's just say that, I just kept going. And you never gave up? No. Uh, you still on no. it? <laughs> I, I could never picture myself. I've, I've worked for other companies as an employee many times throughout my life, and I've enjoyed every single one of them. But for some reason, it was uh, every time I got a job somewhere, it always felt temporary, mm -hmm. like a stepping stone, until I'm able to, to, to do something for myself. 
Are you a son for that? Yeah, um, I mean, through my years in the industry, because I was doing hair for uh, film and theater, fashion shows, and photo shoots and editorials, um, I saw a bit of a gap in the market. I was around 21 at the time. Um, zero experience in, in that aspect. And I, I decided to create an agency. Actually, I've done so many customs here at uni. So I created an agency where I was representing hairstylists, some stylists and a lot of uh, models and uh, background people for advertisement industry and for films. It worked really well. We had an office in the Jean de Clair building and uh, I've run that for two years. It was a lot of work. Um, I mean, it could have been a very successful business if it was maybe now, but for the time when I created it, the industry was too young still. So simple things like and simple procedures would take forever. Um, and a lot of the, the copywriting systems that didn't exist here in Cyprus. So, I mean, it did well. It did left me with a bit of debt at the time. So it wasn't, it wasn't a, you know, a full success story, but um, the successful part of that, the experience I got of handling like more than 20, 200 people and you know, having to produce stuff and send people here and there, having to um, solve clients' issues or momentarily things where they would decide not to appear to the photo shoot or to the advertisement and then you need to kind of find a way and replace that. So mm -hmm. I got a lot of experience. I would never regret that. I actually, it was, was a very fun period of my life. And it was a, the debt was educational debt. It was, it was <laughs> I mean, because I came from a background of, um, I finished as, um, you know, Lyceum, as we say in Greek. Mm -hmm. um, and my, I was good with economics and stuff. That was my major at school. And I ended up going to the hairdressing industry. I mean, for me, I kind of felt that I didn't go to the university experience that I would like to. So it was more than a school on its own, you know, having to handle people, handle payrolls, organize things and be responsible. Um, it was hard two years to so work my ass off, but uh, yeah, I mean, no regrets for it. Um, I ended when I saw that the business wasn't going to bloom and it just was delaying from other things. I cut the thread move forward and yeah here we are today something that i notice a lot of the questions that i'm going to ask you might be you know just from stuff that you say so it's not uh predefined what i notice is is either in cyprus we have either a shock a culture shock of uh of innovative businesses or uh something is just too early yeah as you mentioned um or something is just too creative <laughs> <laughs> like the jeans <laughs> so uh, let's think about that topic. Let's mm -hmm. let's think about how can we uh, introduce innovation or something that is unfamiliar to the market uh, within Cyprus. Let's say maybe someone in the audience right now has an idea, but it's just too too big, too, uh, too big or too outside the box. How do you think someone should handle that or tackle that in Cyprus? Well, if I name that one, um, I mean. Timing is very important in businesses, especially it was it was a bit different in the previous years. Now we seem to be moving along with the speed with the rest of the world mm -hmm. due to the social media craze, to, due to the whole platforms that are being created, blockchain technologies, like you name it. There is every day there is constant new things coming up and we've seen the implementation happening in Cyprus quite relatively fast compared to how it was in the past. Mm -hmm. Also, since we're talking about a local aspect, like I mean, working from Cyprus, right now the platform is not just Cyprus. I mean, you can do a business which refers globally and be in a country like Cyprus, which is sunny, nice environment, easy and friendly, easy to move around, and quite relatively easy to start a business. But a lot of the times, if your product refers to a local market and it's way too innovative, for you to understand in order for you to explain it and pass it to your audience because that's the important thing. So just about you understanding, it's about how the people understand your product, which is one of the challenges I faced. I mean, I was too contemporary in my head for a lot of the stuff that I was thinking mm -hmm. and people wouldn't understand it. So it's about finding the way to communicate to a level where, depending on what your audience is, especially if you're, if you're discussing with a broad audience, you have to make it, as I say, dummy proof. You know, everyone needs to understand and you need to be able to explain your business in one sentence. 
Yeah, I have something to say, um, maybe a little bit different to what um, people may be expecting, but if, if I, I'd say to someone, if they're, if they're planning to launch something in Cyprus and it's very innovative, um, go launch it abroad and then bring it to Cyprus and it will be a success. There is just this thing in Cyprus where um, if you've made it abroad and you bring it to Cyprus, people will engage it even if they don't understand it. Um, if you try to, to launch something very innovative in Cyprus, uh, people are going to look to see where else it is if you've made it outside of Cyprus. I mean, we had this with, with the wines, with um, foreign, foreign labels of wines and foreign types of wines were all, always more popular than the traditional Cypriot uh, product. So do you think people would actually do the research to find out if the business was done outside Cyprus? Or is there like, I don't know, if there are social content that was created outside Cyprus and drawn to Cyprus? If, if it's been, if they've heard of it as something that's been um, launched abroad or something that's made it abroad, um, it, it brings a certain uh, status to the product. Um, whereas if it's something completely new and ahead of its time, yeah. I would add that probably if it's successful abroad, yeah. you bring it uh, to Cyprus, you will um, um, people here sometimes uh, they don't really give the same value at uh, products and services produced uh, in the island than uh, imported from abroad. So uh, what Christina wants to say is that if you make people in here uh, think or understand that uh, what you do is already successful uh, outside the island, they definitely want it, want it in. Uh, I wanted to add another thing, according to my uh, experience. Uh, the only reason I believe that uh, we have, we have uh, some uh, success in what we do with the wines is, first of all, that uh, we know what we do, and second, because I'm completely and uh, extremely stubborn. <laughs> and this is something that uh, I would... Uh, I'd like to say to people that they are interested in starting uh, a business which probably other people don't understand their idea, uh, if they can get in that idea. Uh, you need to be stubborn. You need Very to believe you. and uh, just focus and move on, continue. Well, I was doing a background research about you and I noticed there's a similarity. <laughs> <laughs> I noticed there's a similarity between Lefteris and Mario has in a way that you guys never switch your industry. You stick with one industry from the beginning of your career until now, but Christina is like me. Where it's like we, we, I switched and I noticed that Christina switched as well from one industry to another. Yes, there are relations between the industries, but it's like destroying all the background that we had and starting from somewhere else. So, uh, how, what was it your was it your passion that you made you stay with the industry? How did you know? How did you pick that industry and stay with it? And um, did you plan it? <laughs> well, how did it go? Like, because I'm personally curious about that. Can I start with this? Yeah. Uh, I am a very rare case study. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, but you know, I was uh, one of the very few. Uh, lucky people in that educational system. Uh, I didn't. I, I never wanted to become a winemaker. Uh, to be to be honest, I never knew when I was uh, at the school. I never knew what I wanted to become. Uh, so by luck, I turned up um, uh, in in that school, and uh, I didn't really want it to go. Uh, I started. I started uh, going to the lesson the first uh, uh, the first weeks in uh, the University of Athens where I studied and I really got in love with that thing uh, I don't believe too many people experiencing experiencing something like that so 
someone or something else decided for me. But uh, I was uh, open and I really got that, yes, this is for me, I really, I really love it. And I started building on it, uh, step by step. Uh, I had a turn in my career. I was working as a consultant in uh, different wineries. And uh, just because I had probably a big idea about me, about myself, yeah, that's true, <laughs> I had it, and I still do. Uh, I never wanted, I, I never felt that uh, a CV, presenting my CV was enough for someone to understand how fucking good I was in what I do. So I decided one day to produce a small quantity of uh, wine without giving without caring if it's going to sell or not. Just to have something as a demo of what I do. And this happened in Cyprus. And uh, I decided that uh, uh, the, the biggest challenge for me was to work with Comandaria, which was at the day uh, a very undervalued, undervalued uh, product. So uh, I made Comandaria uh, with my style, with my uh, understanding and approach. Uh, we branded it together with Christina, she did the design, uh, and uh, we released it in the market without really uh, having in mind that this is going to become a business. This was the first time of Vintage uh, ever released. And the reason was just to demonstrate to other people what I can do by working in their winery. And uh, uh, what was I people's think, reaction to that? Sorry? What was others' reaction? The reaction was, uh, at the beginning, was... Uh, there were stages in the reaction. Uh, people wasn't really ready uh, to accept that we can produce, mm -hmm. we can turn something, uh, one of our traditional products that we have, uh, we have it linked with church and history and uh, villages and, um, you know, a souvenir uh, uh, that you can turn it into uh, modern gastronomy and uh, introduce it into the finest uh, category of uh, international wines. Uh, I never had the, the island as my competition, the other winemakers within the island as my competitors. Uh, I always thought that we need to create the brand name Cyprus first and then go abroad and sell our production because for us probably Cyprus is a big island, we call it in Greek Megalonisos, but actually it's a very small island at the eastern Mediterranean, it's an exotic island for the rest of the world with uh, so much history and uh, so beautiful weather, so too many reasons for too many, let's say, uh, to create a whole history, a whole story behind. So that's where I. Uh, that's how you stayed with it. And that's how, and you, how you I started it. it. And it's it's really true because, and he also asked some kind. He somehow answers the previous question I asked about if it's something too innovative how to handle it. And the way to handle that is uh, start really small and have sales um, your last priority. Just do something to test out the market, to see how people's reactions are out there and then collect those reactions and bring it back to your operation. Say, okay, how can I change my business so I can satisfy this demographic of people which are showing a little bit of interest if I tell them to buy my product, they're not going to. So what can I do? Uh, what changes can I do in order for them to become? Get a in my in my my case, uh, the thing was that uh, we we instantly took a lot of uh, uh, recognition from abroad. Mm -hmm. From uh, when I say abroad, even people foreigners that they live in Cyprus, that they have a different culture. And I, I used to say from that day on. But uh, I'm lucky that I'm not Cypriot, but I, I don't say that to uh, insult. I say that because if I was a Cypriot as well, I would have that mentality, that idea about that product, about that, that business, 
that uh, would change me. So I came from uh, another country. I found it and I've seen a hidden gem within, uh, within that product. And I've seen it in my mind becoming a player. So that's the reason behind it. Uh, of course, that I'm stubborn as well. <laughs> <laughs> of course. So this, the title of this event, as you've seen it before when you registered, was Innovative Local Businesses, right? But the question that I'm going to throw here is that um, there are businesses that are already running out there or that they just started, and um, they're looking to introduce innovation within their business. And I know um, you individually have, have done that before. So uh, can you tell us a little bit about how can you introduce innovation within your operation? And well, what have you done? I mean, it, exactly. it all depends. Uh, it all depends on your vision, what you want to do. You know, a lot of people can settle with just uh, being mediocre or just following the trends, following what is already set out there. Um, and that's a simple solution. It's like picking up an idea that already exists, then taking that idea and implementing it. And and this is a, quite a model that we see here in Cyprus with. Cafes trending, kiosks trending, yogurt ice cream trending, and it keeps happening and happening. So we have this tendency of seeing success on an area and people just taking it and implementing it, expecting to see success in the same area, without putting you know a micro niche or uh, an innovation to their business. Um, what makes your business different in a way? So I mean, when I started working, when I started creating here at TC, one of the simple reasons that I created this was that. I've been working freelance for so many years, for uh, more than 10 years, 11 years. And outside of my traveling and doing the session styling work, I had a certain clientele that I was servicing. And to do that, I was renting chairs in other salons, something that people wouldn't even accept here. You know, so it was very tricky for me to, um, I started with a few friends. So I was renting a chair into the salon. I was doing my own clients, giving a percentage to the salon. Uh, and I did that with two or three businesses, which ended up being my friends and assisting them to grow their own business as well. Um, but the format on the question that I was like, why don't you guys come together? You know, there is three different friends, each have their business. Why don't you come together to create something together, something unique? Um, people had a tendency to want to do this on their own, which is, which is um, what uh, Lefteris said, the stubbornness and the persistence of succeeding on a personal level. So by doing that and educating around Cyprus, I started noticing a lot of gaps in the market. So something, a reason for me to create a business, because I had no reason to create a hair salon. I never wanted to create a hair salon. I became a hairstylist accidentally, let's say. Um, as Defteri said, that from a, from a younger age, I had a few passions with creativity, but that wasn't, that was one of those passions. Um, so. I created Hair ETC. The innovation I put in place was simply that I, I wanted to create a space that I would just, people wouldn't just have to be employees or be mistreated in an employee job, something that was happening in our industry for too many years, being put down by the boss and uh, for them to be feeling uh, hating going to work on a daily basis. So I wanted to create an environment where people wanted to come to work and based on their performance to develop themselves without me needing to ever give them a raise. Mm -hmm. So I set up a, a payroll system from scratch, which I experimented through many months of putting numbers in and out, because I love numbers, it's my obsession, uh, to find a system where it was creating a certain balance between the business owner, the business, and, uh, and the people that are involved in working for it. Secondly, I wanted to create a um, the opportunity for other people that wanted to do what I was doing, so like renting a chair, having their own clientele, because a lot of a lot of people in the hairdressing industry, and now we see it happening also in the gym industry and in the beauty industry. Um, I mean, since you put your your art and your hours and your devotion to it, a big part of the money should be going directed to you. Um, so, but a lot of them didn't have the business skills or the business drive to, to start something on their own. A lot of them didn't have the income to do that. So they were stuck between a, between a job that weren't satisfied and the need to escape but not having a business, uh, a business knowledge to actually go and set up their own, their own brand.
So I created the, a big part of, uh, of what we do in Heritage is that we host artists that are freelance. They have their independent, they have their own clientele, they pay their own social insurances, and they work in a, in a community environment where they are involved, but at the same time, they set their own hours and based on how much they use the space, how much production they do, we have certain agreements in place that they leave a certain percentage to the salon for the services they get. So they have they have their own uh, name. They, they they don't have any bosses, but they come under the brand umbrella, not to to yes benefit the brand, but the brand benefiting them. As benefiting well. them at the same time. I mean, most of the most of the arrival, uh, the competitors in the market. Are, as Lefter said, I do not see anyone as a competitor, and that's the one advice if I could say to someone today that wants to do a business, you are your own competitor. There is no competition. Like. Maybe it's like, where do you want to take it? When you're an innovator, you, you don't have uh, competitors. Because yeah. uh, you only have competitors when you do a similar thing. Yeah. That's, so, a very, that's a very nice set from that day, actually, yeah. Um, so, yeah. You said about numbers, we have the polls for, from the audience. And just to let you know what kind of demographic we have here, I asked the question, what is your current career status? And 14% they said, I have a well-operated business. Another 14% said, I just started my business. We've got 29%, which I have a small business looking to grow. And then 43%, which is the winner, I have an idea for a business. So half of our audience here, they either, yeah, they have an idea to start something. So just let, you know, let's shape our tone into either um, the 43% or the 29%, which is to grow or um, to, to start an idea and then 0% said that I'm not into starting business, which is good. <laughs> Actually, now the numbers went down, 50% uh, they said I have an idea. Okay. So half of our audience do. I want to go to Christina because I see that you're a bit quiet now and I, I, I promised everybody equal uh, talk time. So um, when we were on the phone, you mentioned something that uh, you were running your um, your operation, uh, you know, some few orders, and then it happened that you went full capacity and really busy, and like you you you're you're keeping you're barely keeping up with the orders, right? Yeah, at, at the moment, I am. I'm at the. I think uh, for the space that I am in, I'm uh -huh. at the full of my capacity production capacity, because it's a small space, which means that I I, I can only have one assistant. So we're at the maximum of our production capacity at the moment and it's, it's actually quite um, inspiring for myself to, to, to come to be aware of the fact that I, I launched Raising Gastronomes a few months before COVID happened. Um, and it was only the reason that I launched Raising Gastronomes was actually, it was an escape out of the house, the husband and the kids for three days. So I had, I, I, uh, we have twins um, and, and we're alone in raising them. So I, I, I had to leave the business, the wine business um, to, to have the kids, to raise the kids. And then I got to a point where I really needed a way out. So, yeah. and, 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 and it was during my pregnancy that I, I had the idea to start um, making for us healthier sweets without sugar, uh, dairy free, gluten-free, I have a lot of vegan friends and a lot of friends with gluten intolerances, so they were very, very helpful with advice. So, and, and, and also at the same time, it was a photo shoot that I was planning to do for Anama. I wanted to do something different and instead of, of, instead of photograph the actual product, photograph the product together with an accompaniment, something, uh, in, in, in like, um, something edible but something healthy edible, as opposed to sugary sweets and chocolatey sweets. And, and this is what got me started in the kitchen. And then well, we made these beautiful to look at, you know, bliss balls, very, very intricate with fillings and, and coatings and garnishes. They, they looked great on camera and fantastic. Do we, have some? we don't. Mm -hmm. no, we have some of the other. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so first of all, that's, that's, that's an entrepreneur dream. To, to, to start something and have a few orders and just like bam, full capacity, like yeah, everyone's I, I actually I actually didn't... Did you do something or of, that happened? To the, to the day, all of my clients and all of the venues that I, I um, 
supply. Um, I, I didn't go after anyone, they all just came. And it, I think it was a bit of word of mouth um, that just brought clients in and phone calls started coming in and oh, I heard you do uh, bars and I've tasted them, they taste really good. Uh, give me your prices and let's work together. And then one brought the other, brought the other. And she didn't say how good are her, uh, her products, yeah. which is critical. Quality. So well, make something I'll that answer people... that question if I ask it. But... <laughs> <laughs> so how, how did you? How did you? Um, first of all, what was your? Um, how did you measure the quality? First of all, and then how did you? I had to quality? like what I was producing. You you had. To I like had it. to like it. It, 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 and and like I said, I started making these treats during my pregnancy for myself because I stopped um, sugar consumption completely. Mm -hmm. During pregnancy, any 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 women who have had children and have had sugar rush during pregnancy know um, what I'm talking about. But um, yeah, I, I was completely sugar free during my pregnancy. So Are you still sugar free? No, <laughs> no. Um, and and I also wanted to 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 extend that to when the twins were born and then they started to eat solids. I wanted to be able to home make um, treats for them. That not only satisfied uh, sweet to, because all kids like something sweet, but I, I wanted to, to 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 be able to make something that was nutritious. Mm -hmm. Like I used to make them bliss balls, and if they had one or two a day, I was like, you, you can eat whatever you want. You can actually not eat anything at all for the rest of the day. I know that you have the, the nutrients that you need. Um, but it, it was very crucial to have had the experience with Lefteris in the gastronomy industry and and all those years of wine tasting and. Being very well accustomed to um, the, the, the balance in the palate, the acidity, the sweetness, the bitterness, the the richness, the moisture, the whether it's dry or the tannins, and, and and this is actually what 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 made me want to create different flavors, different varieties, all with a very different character. But I wanted it to be pleasing for someone to eat because in the industry, I mean, I used to buy. Uh, energy bars. Energy bars are trending. Most people buy energy bars because they're healthy. And I asked myself a question, how many times have I bought an energy bar and actually really enjoyed what I'm eating? I'll buy and I'll grab an energy bar with my coffee because you know I just have this feeling I'm gonna have an energy bar and I'm gonna fly for the rest of the day because I'm gonna be super 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 energetic. But how many times have you actually really enjoyed what you're eating and said, mm, that's really good. So that's that's how it um, started. And, and, and also, you know, it's got to do with the quality of the ingredients, the percentage of the ingredients that you're using in, you know, when, when most energy bars, in order to keep the cost low, they're using 40, 50, 60, even 70% of oats to make like a granola bar or an oat bar it changes the, the, the flavor at the end of the day. When you're using at least 50% of medjool dates, it, it pushes your price up, but you have a very, very good end product. And Something to add here is that uh, the same thing happened to us and me personally, my, uh, my individual let's say, operation, my personal operation, was that as soon as my tipping point, which brought me success, was to care about giving out value instead of making money when when you shift that mentality and when you get out of that zone which we we're taught from the beginning of school and that's when we work with someone it's all about money 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 when you put that aside and then you say all right i like doing this specific service or product i like making this product and uh how can i bring the most value to my clients to my customers um, and give them the most benefit mm -hmm. and not caring about money. Yeah. Structure the sales into a way not to lose money and go to debt. <laughs> but at the same time to have your focus there. So I, I would say if you can have a second job that feeds you and pays the rent and the mortgage mm -hmm. and whatever, mm -hmm. have it. We all did that. All and this, and this. keep your business in the beginning something very clean of this needs to make me money because the moment that idea comes in and, and that stress comes over the business, this needs to make me money, you're, you're, you're actually killing it before it starts. I think you have to pretend that you don't need this business. Mm. You make it without 
needing it. It's not a business. Which is not true. Yeah. So you have to pretend. But uh, for me, you need to add values to the finance. I mean, value to uh, actual value to the product mm -hmm. uh, or the service. As uh, I mean, quality. Uh, you need to add some ethics on how you do it, how you communicate it. Uh, some uh, uh, let's say solid strategy. You never change. You keep working. Uh, and uh, you always have in mind that if you don't do quick sales, you invest to your clients, you invest into your work, and uh, yes, sometimes uh, we do uh, make uh, what we do uh, sound uh, big and beautiful, but uh, it needs to be big and beautiful when someone comes in terms, it comes and taste it or see it or um, experience. experience it. And this is another value, experience, exactly that. Uh, you don't consume. Things that you, that you consume, uh, they don't really get imprinted in you. Uh, you need to experience and something that I will experience is not designed by me, it's designed by you. That you made. So uh, we don't sell products, we provide experiences. Yeah. Yeah. Excellent. Now that you mentioned ethics, um, through Startup Grind this month is DEI month, which stands for diversity, equality, and inclusion. Uh, diversity and equality is in like either gender equality, uh, racial equality, all sort of equality and uh, diversity. So have you, uh, what kind of, let's say in your business, are you promoting diversity and equality or are you integrating that within your business? I know, Christina, you, you are, your operation is smaller um, to, to go to this zone, but actually I will add to that, are you, are you integrating any sustainable strategies as in like waste, sustainability, uh, green strategies? So let's mix that question together, so diversity, equality, and also sustainability. Um, well, our brand is called Hair ETC, and the ETC abbreviation stands for the versatility and diversity we have in our approach. So it's a big part of um, the values of the company, of the mission, let's say, and the vision that we have. Um, we definitely include diversity in all of the aspects. First of all, like we, we weigh people for who they are and not what they are. Um, and a big aspect that we use in the business is that we hire based on attitude and not so much on skills because that's the very important thing that we're losing a lot in nowadays. Very difficult to find people that are driven and uh, that want to be a part of what you do or they have a bigger vision for themselves, especially with the youth. Um, concerning the practices for ecology and um, protecting the environment and adding more value to, all, you know, to our surroundings, I mean, our, my conscious choice on that was I used my space underground. So it's a 250 square meter basement, semi-basement in the center uh, in the center of Nicosia. And the simple reason that I love that is that I, have a, I always have a soft spot for industrial looking spaces. But the idea that it was underground was maintaining the temperature of the space at 25 degrees constantly. So there is no big windows at the front to get exposed to. Uh, a lot of sun during the summer and a lot of uh, cold during the winter. Mm -hmm. So that helped us solve a big issue with the electricity. We have at least 30% lower, lower consumption of electricity than other equivalent salons to the size that, that we are. Mm -hmm. um, and also, I mean, diversity and versatility things is also a, a big part has to do with the approach. What Lefteris has mentioned and Christina later, I mean, your customer's experience, how do you want them to feel when they are in your space? You don't see them as money anymore. It's just a big, a big part of it is, first of all, you need to love what you're doing. So as the guy said, you need to be, you need, you're your worst judge. You know, like we judge ourselves so bad, especially people will tell you, oh, it's so nice. And you keep banging your head on the wall till you get it even better and better. Mm -hmm. So we keep judging ourselves. Um, 
more and more and that's that's also a big aspect of success and trying harder and trying to become to be different than everything around you trying to achieve your um, your goals so I mean the approach you choose to do a job the mindset behind it um, when a client steps into my chair steps into my salon my main concern is for them to have a great experience um, to give them solutions to their issues either that's a haircut a color or a um, personal issue that they're facing and they feel comfortable um, you know to talk to you uh, we, I take a lot of our industry is a big aspect as a big part that it's a touch industry you know you don't have a lot of people touching you I mean so like now. a social media <laughs> now, now. Yeah. <laughs> and not across even just that I mean you're facing yeah even. across science because I think we both do the same thing you know hairdressers are very regularly asked psychologists or yeah. therapists yeah. You know, simple as the touch you're down go and have a haircut yeah, yeah. you know it's, so it's a touch you're going to get the hair hair stylist everything so you have a person, let's say Christina mentioned it now, you have a person comes to your chair with a certain level of expectations. And this happens to any business. It does, I mean, you can translate it to any service or to any product. Um, a person comes with expectations in your chair, in your shop, or in your business. Um, and that expectations can only be handled by you. So first of all, the approach you take, if that approach is simply getting the client fast and out of there and getting their money, people sense it, it becomes a part of their experience, they will feel it. Um, so if I go with the mindset that that person that sits in my chair or comes into my shop or experience my product or my service um, is a unique person that has certain needs and certain solution, pro uh, certain problems that have need solution, mm -hmm. then my approach changes in the whole matter. So the whole thing becomes more holistic, more anthropocentric, like human human centric than just okay come here to get an experience like a kiosk you just come in and out it feeds back back to you as well when, yeah. you, when you give the nice experience to your client it comes back their to you. experience comes back to you and you enjoy i that. mean we didn't have a business card for i don't know how many years how many years like even as a hairdresser of my own or even as a business um and i didn't even care really because your main advertisement is word of mouth especially in an industry like cyprus Social media just expands that uh, that word of mouth uh, concept, mm -hmm. but true true clientele mm -hmm. here in Cyprus it's a very word of mouth system. Like someone likes what you do, experiences it in a certain way, mm -hmm. they're gonna share it with another five people at least. And I've seen uh, we've seen our business grow. We're starting social media campaigns now after three and a half years of owning a business simply because we wanted that organic growth we wanted that relevant customer that shares that experience that they get with others who come through our door rather than just an irrelevant you know random person that just saw an advertisement online talk about social media uh, i know well, you're a living school yeah you're amazing <laughs> <laughs> can i add something uh, yeah not sure not add, yeah, just uh, uh, light another point of view because mario said everything um, this is how uh, the, the clients see it. I want to add the view that you have for your business. I mean, there are people that they start a business because they need it in order to live. And other people that they start a business uh, without really caring because they, they have already everything, but they need to do something. I believe that it's really important for everyone to be happy mm -hmm. while they do uh, what they do. Uh, I told you that uh, my hobby is astrophysics, so I'm, I like to see things, I like to see the bigger view and always what you look out to find it, it's uh, focused in one uh, single dot that is inside. Uh, I'm quite sure that it's very important to decide what kind of lifestyle you want to live and uh, adopt this, ad adopt your business into, into this. Uh, I mean, it always look uh, some kind of uh, uh, artificial when you try to fit your lifestyle into your business. Uh, personally, I, I sat and I say, look, I would like to live that kind of life uh, and uh, this, I think this was my, uh, my innovation, that 
I tried, I adopted a business which is, uh, was very formal at the, at the time into the lifestyle that I wanted to live. Mm -hmm. um, that made me happy, that uh, made me not feeling bad for being in vain stubborn for many years because I was having fun. I didn't make any money at the time because uh, the market wasn't really ready at the moment when I was in my beginning. But uh, making me happy uh, gave me the strength to have another job, to support what I do and what I have as a vision. Uh, stay focused on this vision, not getting disappointed by other people that they really loved me and they was um, advising me, come on, probably it's time to leave it and start something else. No, <laughs> I <I'm very laughs> because that makes me happy and I have a vision. There are people that they search for it. I just didn't find them yet. I will. And uh, started to come in. Uh, because it was nothing artificial, it was nothing. I wasn't pretending. I was really authentic. And authenticity, thank you for, uh, for the word. It's uh, really important. And uh, uh, this is probably your innovation. Because I don't think that there are innovative ideas out there. There are only innovative people. And they do innovative things in everything they do. Because they don't have uh, rules that they, they have to follow. They don't have um, uh, a map. A map. The plan, yes. They don't have a map. They are outside and they say, yeah. yeah, yeah. You create your own path. I mean, I mean, one of the reasons we're such a good friends with guys, because with the, the guys, is, and we met accidentally, but it's, it's simply that, like, the, um, first of all, you see that their job is their lifestyle. So their location is fantastic, and it's their house, and their work, and their winery, and it's just, you can understand the culture and the lifestyle they create behind the brand, that it, was, it wasn't fake. Mm -hmm. And also, like, if you feel, it's very important to have like-minded people in anything you do, like, if you want to start a business, keep people next to you that inspire you. Stay away from toxicity. Yeah. yeah. People that wants to put you back mm -hmm. and, and pull you back and, oh yeah, why do you want to spend the extra hours? Let's go out. Or why you want to do this? Let's just why don't you count your hours? Yeah. yeah. You can't count them. You can't. <laughs> uh, and that goes for relationships that just, too. That just makes you more crazy. You know, it goes for, you know, yeah, but it goes for relationships. Work. Like if yeah. you work a lot of hours, you have a partner that does not understand the same, then it's a big problem. Um, you grow more if your partner is a big part of what you do, or just stay on your own. If your business is your is your full passion, you stay on your own if you cannot find the right partner. So if you want to launch a business, it's important to really believe in what you do, enjoy it. Like, so if you start a business that you do not enjoy, first of all, you won't be happy, so you won't be able to share that happiness. As I've said, how, how can you share happiness when you don't have it yourself? You know, how can you, how can you promote a business when you don't believe in it yourself? So it's important to have that love of what you do and also keep people around you that are like-minded. Love is energy. <laughs> <laughs> let's, uh, let's shift our focus to our audience a little bit. Obviously, 50% of our audience here, they have an idea and um, they want to turn that into a business. So um, for them, how would you turn an idea into a business? Like, what is your suggestion? What's the first step? So now you can start. Uh, that's that's really broad, but um. You can zoom out a bit. You don't need to go specific marker or management, managerial. Just specific. Like, what is the first, let's say, area they need to tackle? You know, to okay, yeah, I'm gonna yeah. zoom out even more and say. Are you, are you able to create a vision, say like you have this big cinema screen in your head on which you can project what you want to create? Are you able to see this out there? Are you able to see it being successful? Are you able to see yourself enjoying it, managing it, running it? Are you able to see people engaging with this? If you're able to see it, 
then the next thing I would say that and I'm 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 really I really do mean like picture it. And and when you've pictured it, if you manage to picture it, then I would say bring in the emotions. How would that make you feel? How is this gonna make your audience feel, your clients feel? How is this gonna um give value to your life and how is it going to give value to your audience bring in the emotions actually feel feel the happiness feel the pride that you will feel when you've actually done it and when you're actually at the point that you're envisioning if you are able to create this without any blockages or without any if and buts and what if and then I would say you're probably halfway there because this is also part of creation if you're able to just and when you start with that i would say stick with it and start taking small steps in that direction whether it's calling in a few favors from friends it can get you i don't know uh, expensive. yeah expensive. And, and 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 just trust in the process trust in the um the journey, trusting yourself, keep that vision, keep your eye on the vision, block out toxicity besides, this is just so important, block it out. If you can't deal with toxicity and if you allow it to get to you, it's going to bring you down, it's going to take you off track. Um, this is a life lesson, you have to do this in all your aspects in of your life. In absolutely everything, yeah. Personally, yeah. I see it, uh, you, you need to see it from, uh, to, to the other, uh, to, to the opposite uh, side of the table and uh, answer the questions that uh, your clients will, uh, will ask. I mean, is this any reason for that new brand to exist? Is it someone who needs it? Someone who would uh, appreciate it? Probably not now, within, uh, within time, but uh, is it a true reason for that brand to exist. Uh, are your people, are you, is your business going to be something that um, pleases people because there's an existing um, expectation or an existing um, need? Or is this something that's going to surprise people in the sense that, you know what, I didn't know that I needed this, I didn't know that I wanted this. This is actually a really good idea. And another question probably is, if someone tries to copy what I do, uh, which one of us will survive? Uh, because we live in a uh, in a uh, uh, in, the, uh, in a society that uh, too many people they have they don't have authenticity. Uh, they don't have their own ideas. They just want to make money, and when they see some business thriving, they say, oh, that's a good idea, uh, I could copy it. But which of those two will survive through time? Um, uh, if I may, I mean, um, I'm, I really loved uh, what, what Christina said at the beginning. I'm a big fan of visualization myself. I mean, uh, visualization is the key to a lot of things. If, if your idea is it's exactly what Christina said, like it's a video that has a story, it has a a beginning, a middle, and a, and a, and a path. I'm not going to even say an end, but a path and you can really see your idea moving forward. You can see yourself doing those things. You can see the success coming behind it. Then I would say it's a very, it's a good place to start. Usually inspiration and ideas get created in the first, and we see it. I mean, I, I work as a creative director most of the time. I, pro I make projects. The best ideas are created in one second. The rest of the seconds is your logic doubting that ideas. <laughs> the next, yeah, it's like about what if I fail, about what this idea is needed. But so the first few seconds is the true original inspiration. So you take that first few seconds, that aha moment, mm -hmm. that moment that I'm just saying, not <laughs> that moment where you get the goosebumps mood just thinking of that idea, and then you you go with that. But that's just the beginning. I mean, to be able to establish that idea and then visualize it try to stop your doubting logic because attraction and the law of attraction attracting things like that in your life does not have logic 
is what you said, like any entrepreneur's dream is the, the speed of things, the way they arrive, you cannot expect it. From one day to the other, you become successful and you don't even realize it. So you cannot measure it in logical time. You can't plan it. Either. Yeah, you can plan it. But what you can do is, that idea comes in place, then I'm a big, I'm a big freak of lists and organizing. Like, I love it. So there will be to-do lists, there will be a structure behind everything. I need to understand what is what and why. I mean, before I did my business, I was designing a simple square because I love designing. So I was on Adobe Design, I was designing, uh, sorry, on Adobe Illustrator, which is not an architectural program, but doesn't matter, it's still a tool. Um, I was designing to see the ideal salon for me, what it would look like, even in lines, in little boxes, in actual sizes, micrography of sizes, just to understand what kind of a size of space I was looking for and attract it to me. Mm. And I came to the conclusion that I could do anything between 250 and 350 square meters to do what I wanted. So the design was pretty much just a square of lines on an illustrator. And that space got attracted in my life in a month. As soon as I found that space and I, I saw that I was working, you know, I had to, I had to say, can I achieve it financially? Or is it gonna be a successful business? Because then you start having data, like how much is the rent? What is means of renovating a space like that? What is on the long-term plan? So uh, you start having data. And when I found the space, I remember I told to the lady that owned the space, which she was pressuring me to get it. I told her I need two months. I just need two months. In two months, I had to I design a business plan knowing of like being very realistic because the one thing we like to do is wishful thinking oh yeah it's okay i'm gonna put this chair there and that office here and all of a sudden yeah, i'm gonna have this business i can do it with fifty let let's say an next number usually whatever we think is one and a half to two times yeah. <laughs> to the real the, 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 real, the <laughs> realism of the situation so we need to be very realistic on any ideas we take because and numbers never lie like a good idea is a good idea, but numbers never lie whether that idea can be successful, can be applied. I mean, if it's a product you're creating, like the guys do, still numbers stand behind it, but if the product is such a strong product on its own, the and you have a path, yeah, exactly. exactly. But when you're building a business that sells services, let's say in my case, of course my product was good, my service was good, I already had a backup of clientele, I knew that I was gonna follow me, but still, I was doing something in a bigger scale than just myself. So, did the numbers, would the numbers do the atom? Like, would I, can I survive this business for two years to three years? Because any business you do, it takes about three to five years to start breaking even and creating profit. Um, at least. At least. <laughs> at least. And depending if it's a good scenario and a good situation with the economics and, the, and you know, what's happening around you. So. Set a good plan in place. Get your idea, be sure about your idea, don't let anyone doubt you. You gotta start doubting yourself, but don't take that as a, as a oh my God, I have to pull back. Take that as a, um, you know, the devil's advocate. It's like you're self-contradicting and conflicting yourself. It's just information, it's data. So you need to see that data because you're gonna do it either you want it or not, it's gonna happen. Uh, then start putting that idea into paper start planning, start creating a system behind that idea, start visualizing it and start seeing the numbers. If the numbers give you a good result, then you have the second phase ready and then you need to go to implementation and development, which is putting all of those numbers, all of the planning and all of those ideas into action and see actually a result. And the one thing just to close on that is that have flexibility for your idea to change. Just keep a vision. Don't have like, a, if we take it as an example of visualize, I have the perfect cup. I know the color, I know the size of the handle, I know, I know what it fits inside and all of that, but keep an open mind because a lot of can change in the, in the process and you can be disappointed if, you're, if you think you're moving away from what you've been thinking, but Moving away might be actually what you need to reach your target. Yeah. 
man, this guy is amazing, man. <laughs> <laughs> I really admire him. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know, if I had you in my business, it would be a superstar business. <laughs> Definitely you have me in your business. Well, why not? <laughs> yeah, why not? Why not? We have to discuss this. Uh, I'd like Divine, to add, always uh, discuss this. one more time, like to another dimension. Uh, he's completely right in everything he said. But what happened to people that they don't have that uh, skill in numbers and planning? Because not everybody is like this. I'm a plan freak as well, but I'm not that good with numbers. I never think with numbers. I only think with uh, ideas. So in my case, uh, back to 2012, I applied for the first time and never did it the second time uh, for uh, funding to start my business, to, to build my winery. Uh, it was a European. European. Too many businesses to funding. It's not something that uh, it's uh, rare. Uh, I thought it would be easy to me as well. I had all the uh, qualifications to take part in that funding. And uh, I thought that uh, this was my way forward. Yeah, your ticket. Success. <laughs> yes. So I did apply as well. For some magical reason that refers back to uh, our state mentality, which is not a conversation that I want to start right now, uh, I've been rejected. And uh, that was really uh, article? Yeah. Okay. unfair. Because I had all the qualifications uh, needed, uh, I I already had to spend some money to follow a lot of money to follow the uh, guidelines. Uh, guidelines and restrictions to take part in uh, this process. This process and apply uh, all the money that I had to make uh, the designs of the building uh, and blah blah blah, and I've been rejected. And uh, depression. No depression. I've lost everything. Um, I decided that uh, I took it really. I'm from Crete, you know, we are the savage people. <laughs> 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 we <are> barbarians. <laughs> and uh, very masculine. So we deci I decided to uh, let, let, let this behind and uh, start my own. Uh, making my own design, which I'm going to construct it myself. Uh, I got really disappointed, but I've seen. The trophy that gave you the motivation. Yes, yes, yes. But uh, look, next year, 2013, the crack happened, and I really imagined myself having that big loan in my bag. So I was lucky. I was lucky because. Uh, the time, get, the situation gave me some time to reschedule, and reflect, reflect. reflect, and uh, bloom. Because I had the skills, I never knew that I had those skills, and I never knew that I had that uh, skill which says, yes, I'm open to develop new skills. This is a skill on its own. So. I made my own design for a smaller winery. I had the experience. I've been working to so many wineries. I, I knew the design tricks and the design details that I needed in order to have a, a winery which would be uh, working properly, uh, giving me re, um, uh, solutions in uh, different pro architectural, I mean, solutions in the way that I wanted to work and make it friendly for people to, uh, to come and experience a, a visit in this winery. So I started building uh, everywhere that you see stone upon a stone in my winery. I did it myself. I did the carpentry. I did so many things because I truly believed it. And uh, the numbers probably were not on your paper, no. on my paper, yeah. but uh, I don't want to repeat that I'm stubborn. Everyone, so uh, since 
sometimes you are not in the position to calculate numbers and the numbers to give you the, the push to do it. Sometimes numbers are not in your favor. But uh, if you really believe in your idea and you really believe in your skills and you really believe that there is people out there that they are searching for what you are about to start. So stick with it. Yeah. Stubbornly stick with it. Excellent. I want to um, move back a little bit to, to, a, to a fresher, uh, to a new topic to discuss. Since that um, COVID happened a couple of years ago, it was a year and a half? Oh, two. So two years, fine, fine, two years almost, already. Yeah. yeah. So what, what we experienced in Cyprus, and we all saw it as well, is a lot of businesses um, had a massive digitalization shift. So they either um, started their e-shop, they either started taking their orders online, etc. Uh, first of all, how are you introducing technology? in your businesses and just your comments and recommendation in that area in digitalizing um, your businesses or having a conversation for it. Christina? I'm not the specialist in that question. <laughs> You're very active also in social media, which is it's very good in social media. Yeah. I'm, I'm it's very innovative in yeah. social media. I'm a very visual person. I'm, I, yeah, the, um, a good photograph will sell. So I, I would always say invest in good photography. Um, and yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, if I may add on to that, like, um, I mean, when the COVID hit, for me, it was a, sorry to say, but it was a bliss. Because <laughs> I've been I've been working from 19 years old, <laughs> yeah. and I never had like to sit more than a month in my life. I don't know what unemployment means. I never got a single fund. I've been paying social insurance from 20 years old. So, and you can do this without feeling guilty. Yeah, I mean, I see, yeah, 10 months of air, or the whole world being on pause. It kind of gives you a certain sense of just comfortable. Like I mean, my girlfriend is in the crowd as well, and. Uh, we were staying together for the first time during that period. So uh, it took me about a month just to unwind to be able to sit on a chair outside and just get the sun in my face. <laughs> um, so, I mean, COVID, any, like, any, like any problem and any trouble that is happening, it creates opportunities. The, the, yeah. what the, the speed of digitalization that came with COVID couldn't have been happened like in any other way. It would have taken us three to five years to reach the level we are right now. And it's speeding up even faster. So I'm I'm really really excited to see what is coming in the next two three years. So what I did was the one important thing is I did with Sorts Media. <laughs> I did my website. So I had the chance to actually, and I brought something just for you guys to see. Um, I had the chance to, to design my website the way I wanted it, the way I visualized my shop. Because as Lefteris said, you need to develop extra skills when you want to set up your business. I was working hands-on building the salon, breaking rock and welding metals and like going to work at the salon and then coming back and being a builder in the morning. <laughs> so it was a, it's a constant struggle. So I learned how to design. I learned how to design UIX, so web designing, like just the, just the experience. I don't know how to develop, but I, I know how I wanted my, my customer to experience my website. So simple thing, like this is something that we created during the during the COVID, which is the website. And I wanted something, as, uh, as we discussed before, like dummy proof. So, I mean, you pretty much have the phone, the locations, the emails, the maps, everything constantly following you where you go. And in contrary to other websites, you move it sideways. So we wanted to bring that versatile and approach um, to, you know, that we wanted to offer with our experience. We wanted to offer it through our website, but make it very simple because at the moment, we were seeing that everything was just scrolling down and keep scrolling. And uh, I mean, I am very OCD about fonts and designs. I get very obsessive. I get into a website, if it's too busy, I get out, I don't care what it is. You know, so I wanted something very simple for my audience to understand. And because my business was anthropocentric, I wanted that to come out through my 
the digital aspect. So simple things like pressing on the studio, which just explains you what the studio is. It just shows some photo of, what, of our space so the audience can understand what we do to um, you know, showcasing our team in a different way. Most of the salons would showcase their teams through a, a website, through, sorry, a, a price list and never would show who they are. In our case, our team has their own, uh, I'm just showing you mine, so I don't GDPR, I'm show someone else. <laughs> uh, so, you know, a bio and all of our social media and who that person that is going to cut your hair and do your service is and a portfolio of their work, etc. So the one thing that, that we really focused was um, creating a decent website that really did the trick and it really paid off because people kept coming and saying oh my god I didn't know who you were and when I researched on Google we saw your website and it's such a cool website so we came you know like they had no idea what our what our um, what our services were like or where we're good or not they just saw the photos of the space and and uh, a website that really communicated with them um, the second part was that we saw a lot of rise of digitalization on the online shopping. So, uh, and instead of struggling and doing our own online shop and running the whole thing, we took up on a service that started because of that. And we started seeing sales on that service that we wouldn't expect would never come. Like, I mean, um, I don't buy my products online uh, and I'm, a, I'm a quite a technological person. Uh, thirdly, we started exploring the online booking which was because uh, we were working with a software that already had that as a part of it, incorporated to it. We started exploring it and we are at the point right now that we're going to launch our online booking by next year. Um, because as I said, it was very important for me to have a very solid team, solid structure, a good quality of service and experience before I attract extra clientele. And with the time also, I saw this an opportunity to create another business that would take me from a hands-on business like hairdressing that we saw got so impacted from uh, all of the lockdowns to creating a digital platform that deals with the online and beauty industry or uh, hair and beauty industry on an online aspect. So yeah, I mean, uh, I like to see every opportunity that comes in the way and any trouble, as Lefteri said, as a drive as an opportunity and COVID did exactly that. Excellent. And uh, just to wrap things up from the discussion because we want to have the networking cocktail after, um, let's talk about Cyprus and let's talk about your industries uh, one by one and uh, get some insights from you about your industry because someone maybe from our audience is interested within to to operate within your industry so uh you're into fashion and beauty hair and beauty and fashion, hair and beauty yeah. fashion. christina you're into um, food and snack i would say and jewelry also as well and uh the days you're into winemaking industry um please share with our audience some of the insights some of the opportunities what's happening in your industry something that you see that is for the next three years might grow might boom my die. Uh, when I started uh, working in the wine business, uh, it was the opportunities were for the big wineries around the world. Uh, people, consumers wanted the branded wines, the big wineries, uh, wineries that they had uh, millions of uh, uh, bottles production uh, that they. They own different wineries around the world. Uh, in our times, that completely shifted into... Uh, right now, consumers want to find a small production um, with a story behind, uh, authenticity, um, new uh, ideas, uh, a part of the industrialized uh, a big name that everybody wanted to have. Uh, so, for me, having your own authenticity and uh, trying to uh, express yourself and create uh, 
don't know how to describe it, but um, get out of the box, create something new. You don't really need to follow guidelines and copy what's already out there. It is already out there. Uh, you need to see it from your own point of view. More people will see it like this, will find it fresh, will find it... Um, they, they, they need, they need something different than what's out there already. So I think that in winemaking business, uh, the opportunities are not within uh, the island necessarily. Uh, your customers are everywhere because you can send your products, you can communicate your brand, you can find people that they are collecting, you can find people that they try other things and they are uh, really want to, want to try what you do because hear your story. Uh, hear your story. Be inspired. I think a lot of people are looking for inspiration. Mm -hmm. They go out there, they visit, they, they go for, a, to, for to have their hair cut or they, they, they visit a winery or they, they go to a restaurant. To, other than the experience, I think a lot of people are looking to be inspired because everyone has their own personal story going on at the same time. And in a world where, you know, a, a, a lot can seem very, very bland, I find myself sometimes, most of the times, looking for that something extraordinary. I'm not interested in ordinary, I'm interested in extraordinary. So it doesn't matter what you're going to do, um, make it extraordinary. Whether if it's a product, invest in the quality. Um, the numbers matter, but quality. Um, being yeah, extraordinary. <laughs> no, I love numbers, but it, it's, it's, it's different you when you sell a service and it's different when you sell a product. Yeah. It's, it's like what Mario said before. If you have Very a good product, a good quality product, people will be willing to pay the difference in price. You than still they need to calculate to the numbers with your uh, expenses. Good quality and service. But still, uh, you yeah. know, if I was uh, a tourist coming to Cyprus and uh, I had the opportunity to, to see. Uh, what uh, Marius does uh, via his website or wherever, I would really love to have an experience like this. Yeah. I mean, you never know who's your next client. Yeah, that's very good. That's very good saying. I mean, um, the opportunities now, the like with all the digital aspects. Um, let's say that it was um, we were watching our businesses through a two D lens. Now with all of the new technologies that are approaching, I mean, I, I, I get inspired by 14 and 15 and 18 year olds making millions out of nothing. I mean, not, I got obsessed with NFT lately and you see people selling PNG photos for millions. So there is no way you cannot find an approach in any industry that you pick to place yourself. You know, like I started seeing my, my, my industry from a whole different level. I'm thinking, what is going to happen now in 20 years? Is hairdressing still going to be a hands-on service? If it is, and it's still going to stay as a traditional service, so then everything around it won't be. So how do I get there? You know, like, so if you decide to do something in the hair and beauty and the fashion industry, the supporting services around it, the supporting, supporting platforms, supporting businesses that comes around the hair and beauty and fashion industry are huge. I mean, the one idea we're developing is basically focusing on, on uh, you know, technologically advancing and organizing green efficiency to traditional industries like hair and beauty. We still work in an environment where you still need to touch the other person. They still need to physically come into your space. They need to sit there for specific hours and you need to do the service one to one or two to one, depending on the service. So. There is, sometimes there is not a lot of innovation and a lot of stuff you could bring on the table to change that because that's the industry. It means I need to program a robot cutting the hair in order if I want to advance technologically what I'm doing. But you need to think outside that from a wider, uh, from a wider point of view, from a bird's eye view. Like, see the big picture. It's like, how do I advance what I do? How do I differentiate myself, my business, so it, it's innovating 
it brings a new proposal on the table and at the same time it moves with the future you know how the technology moves how the how the social media moves how in general the world's moving so yeah i mean keep always exploring the industries you want to be in and just don't see it from a from a one perspective well i think uh, our discussion here was very deep i was not expecting that <laughs> You know, to decide to get <laughs> mentally inside. Don't get us together on the field. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe next time I'll pick a different venue. Because, uh, <laughs> maybe the nature or something. But, That's uh, actually a very good idea. Because yeah. wine helps these kind of conversations. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> it also helps people to engage. Of course. So. That's about it for this discussion. Thank you, Mario. Thank you, Christina. Thank you, Lefteris. Thank, Thank you, guys. Bye. Bye. Bye.